it's awesome to be here. I'm Jennifer Dunlop Fletcher. I'm the Helen Hilton curator, Helen Hilton Riser Curator of Architecture and Design at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and so thrilled to be joined uh, with Stephen Burks, um, founder of Stephen Burks Manmade, and Dakin Hart, senior curator of the Osama Noguchi Foundation Garden and Museum. Maybe I got the order wrong. And they have both joined us from the East Coast and came out just for these two days for this talk. So I'm very, very happy that you're both here today. Um, just a really brief little intro. Um, Stephen, you have, of course, your designer and your, um, uh, sorry, your, um, <clears throat> have been in many museum shows already, including <laughs> the, uh, the first product design at the Studio Museum in Harlem, um, first uh, African-American designer to receive the National Design Award at the Cooper Hewitt, and going to be the subject of a forthcoming exhibition at the High Museum in Atlanta this coming fall. And have really, your practice has, um, you've, you've really worked with so many amazing fabricators. Uh, Capolini, De Don, uh, Moroso, endless, endless. Um, so it's it's a pretty uh, unique and interesting practice to be uh, both, of course, on view, available, sold everywhere, as well as on view and, and uh, in the uh, public realm in museums. Um, she says this to all the designers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Um, and uh, Dakin, senior curator at the Osama Noguchi Museum for 12 years now? Nine. Nine years now. Um, you started out here in San Francisco at the Fine Arts Museums. And uh, I, I came to know Dakin. Oh, I have a little slide, too. I came to know Dakin through our work together on the um, Osama Noguchi Playscapes at SF MoMA, and it was such a pleasure to talk to you. You, um, you have this really uh, enviable curator job of really being so um, protective and knowledgeable about all of your holdings, as well as thinking about a, a kind of a past figure who's still relevant today and curating contemporary exhibitions uh, whose work is really in conversation with uh, Noguchi. So uh, kind of historian, curator, and uh, programmer, uh, wearing a lot of really interesting hats. Um, it's the best job in America, honestly. <laughs> it's it just absolutely incredible. I mean, it's an, a privilege. Um, I, you know, I try to live up to it every day. Uh, but yeah, it's amazing. We, you know, in a way, we're a museum that acts a little bit more like an artist studio, um, and that's all in furtherance of this legacy and trying to make sure that you know, I think of Noguchi as a language, and our job is just to make sure that it stays current, you know, that it doesn't become Latin in the church, uh, but stays, you know, much more used uh, than than that. So. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed our conversations when we were working on this uh, exhibition together. And recently, uh, Stephen, I got to know you very recently because we were able to bring in this amazing work, very brand new work. Thank you. you Thanks so much. In. And we are going to be showing it this fall in an exhibition that I'll be talking about in just a little bit. But for um, the audience sake, I wonder if you might spend you know, a, a few minutes just talking about some upcoming projects uh, that you're working on. Yeah, um, of course. Um, advanced slides, if you tell me. Oh, uh, it looks like Bacon <laughs> might be up first. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay, these are our slides. So um, we have a show opening at White Cube in London uh, in just a couple of weeks. And uh, it's called Osama Noguchi and New Nature. It's actually, it's really nice to talk about it here because in 1970, Noguchi came out and gave a talk to uh, students at the San Francisco Art Institute. And one of the things that he told them was that they should be working on creating a new nature. And he explained to them that concrete is nature and galvanized steel is nature and interstellar space is nature. Um, he just wanted to get them thinking about, and this is the way that he thought, was, uh, you know, Noguchi was not an either or person, he was an and person and was always looking for ways to connect and hybridize. And he really believed that we needed to create a kind of synthetic forms of being natural, 
a synthetic version um, that would better harmonize us with the main part of nature. Um, the great thing about Noguchi is an ecologist. He really is a, an ecologist because everything he always thought in systems. Um, you know, sculpture is the object, but it's also the space that the object is in, and it's the people experiencing that space in those objects. That's a kind of ecology. But he didn't hate mankind, which is really nice. He didn't think that the solution to the planet's problems was to get rid of all of us. Um, he just thought it was better design, basically, that we should do a much better job of uh, sort of our part of managing Spaceship Earth. Um, and that's kind of what the show is about. So it's a version of his versions of a new nature. So <laughs> in terms of what we've got going on, we've just moved into a new studio um, in the Navy Yard in Brooklyn, if some of you guys may be familiar with that. Um, we're so excited. The Navy Yard is a great community of artists and designers and uh, manufacturers. Mostly, um, it's part of a tech triangle in New York. Uh, and the studio is called Steven Burke's Man Made because we're all about bringing the hand to industry. Um, we've spent quite a lot of time working in craft uh, in collaboration with manufacturers around the world. And so we look for ways to use the hand where the hand is most useful. Um, and we're going to have an open studio during the ICFF uh, coming up soon. Uh, it's, this picture is pretty telling because at one point in my uh, career, I had seven storage lockers. Um, I'm a bit of a hoarder. <laughs> And it's, it's tricky when you make things for a living, you, have, you end up collecting a lot of things, um, prototypes and drawings, et cetera. Um, the beautiful burden that Dakin has going through Noguchi's work, um, we have every day uh, encountering my own work and, and the studio is actually uh, an oversized storage locker. So um, I welcome all of you guys to come and visit if you're in town. Yeah, um, so this is the next, uh, we do thematic rotations from the collection. Uh, we curate shows from the collection. The uh, Simon Noguchi Foundation and Garden Museum uh, is the artist's legal heir. So we have everything that he left when he died. Um, I was joking earlier, we've got a slip and slide, we've got broken Betamax VCR and his members only jacket from the 70s. We've got everything. It's the full material culture of Noguchi. Um, and it's a huge pleasure to go through it. But um, so we are doing, the next show is called Subscapes, which is actually comes from, it's appropriate to talk about it here. It's a concept of George Nelson's. Um, Nelson was really interested in everything below the level of the tabletop because he believed that it was a totally underutilized or underexplored area of design. Um, and Noguchi shared that opinion. Of course, the Herman Miller coffee table is a table that was all about emphasizing the base. Um, but this, it, it permeates Noguchi's practice in a lot of ways. Um, so we're doing a show about that. And, and the flying thing that you see there is a portion of the set that Noguchi made for George Balanchine's Orpheus, um, which was scored by Stravinsky. And um, it's one they still perform with a version of Noguchi's set. And we're making an exhibition copy of that set that people will be able to interact with and experience. What's neat about it, what's happening there, is that uh, the way that they uh, dramatized the descent into hell was to have the rocks fly. Uh, so we're gonna make the rocks fly as well so that you have an opportunity to descend into hell and come out again. <laughs> I, I love hearing about the slip inside. I think, Stephen, don't apologize for having all that stuff. I'm seeing a future museum in... The, in... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry. yeah um, so this is a project of mine done some years ago with an Italian textile manufacturer named Dadar, um, Dadar Milano. Uh, it is the uh, Fabrizio family um, with a small factory in Como. Uh, and these are called the roping stools. Um, we made, I think, this edition, uh, there are actually three sizes, but in an edition of two. And uh, the, uh, one of them is being borrowed from our studio and traveling to uh, Saint-Étienne for the design biennial. Um, and I think it's Catherine Rossi who's curating that. So we're, we're really uh, proud of that. Um, the roping stool is made from trimmings from the Dadar collection. 
uh, and turned into a kind of textile belt that holds together, speaking of hybrids, um, manila rope uh, and that's rubber dipped uh, at the base uh, to create a kind of, uh, in a sense, neo-primitive uh, hybrid of what uh, a stool can be. Uh, okay, we're also working on an exhibition um, that is a partner to Subscapes uh, called Impraise of Caves, which is uh, Mexican organic architectural projects uh, by those four artist designers. Um, and uh, that is going to open in the fall. And it, uh, we're turning the entire Noguchi Museum into a kind of a, a serpent's nest. Um, into a cave. Uh, and the neat thing about um, these artists and designers in the middle of the last century in Mexico is they got interested in caves not in some kind of form of nostalgia, but looking to the future. Um, it's one of the, the sort of a, uh, offshoot of the atomic era. Um, but it was designers who basically the premise was we're going to bomb the planet into inhabitability. So let's get working now on making caves modern and inhabitable the way we live today. And so it was very forward looking and, and sort of futuristic. Um, and so we're going to be exhibiting some of those projects. Um, and uh, one li wonderful living architect who probably not a lot of people in the United States know about, but Javier Sinosian, um, who is a person who's kind of um, the, uh, both a scholar and a practicing architect who has really created the kind of understanding of this group of architects who practice bioarchitectura, um, uh, sort of biological architecture in Mexico. Totally fascinating. That, and sorry, that picture is a place you can go and stay. If anybody is turned on by that, there's actually an Airbnb in that facility. It's called El Nido de Quetzalcoatl. Um, it's a 10-acre park that Javier is making. All of it design, he's designed, including all of the serpents. But that is an apartment building, um, this big loop of the snake that's going overhead. Wow. Have you stayed there? I have not stayed there, no. <laughs> So the cool thing about um, spending time with Dakin is you just learn so much, and we can't <laughs> we can't wait to go to these shows in New York. Honestly, it's awesome. Um, so next up for us, uh, I'm going to be keynote speaker at the Stockholm Furniture Fair, which was moved from February to uh, September. Um, if any of you have heard about that, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we're hoping to show a collaboration with uh, a new. A home bedding company called uh, Manuberg, which is, uh, I think, recently acquired by Quadrat. And this is a funny photo shoot we did at home. Um, you're seeing my Zoom corner here, <laughs> which is uh, our a library, um, a shelving system that I designed called Horizon. Uh, and then in front of it um, is an African birthing chair, I think from uh, Ivory Coast with three Manuberg uh, covered pillows on it. So this is, this is kind of a concept sketch for a new chair. I like it. <laughs> and oh, there's right, still we, one more. <laughs> we have too many of these. Okay, I know. Yeah, we can just, we okay, can. Keep going. There's one more that I want to okay. talk about. Okay. Okay. okay, anyway, okay, shelter, shelter in place. <laughs> so this I'm super proud of. Um, this is my first solo museum exhibition in 10 years since uh, the show at the Studio Museum. It's both mid-career survey um, and speculative project. Um, coincidentally, it's 50 years since the new domestic landscape show at the uh, MoMA. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So for us, uh, it grew out of, and this may be, we'll probably talk about this again, but it grew out of, uh, it's called shelter in place because it grew out of our time in lockdown. Um, and was a moment when I think all designers needed to become more creative when we were all kind of confronting our, our home lives again. Opening September 16th. <laughs> and um, I, uh, Danny, I think we are ready to go to the looping and I'm hoping maybe you will introduce, uh, when, you, when you were talking about Stephen Burke's Man Made, you said we, and uh, maybe that's an opportunity to, to introduce the, the slideshow. Um, I guess before we get started, I just want to thank The Fog for having us here. Um, SF MoMA, of course, um, and Jennifer's support has been incredible. Um, 
Susan Swig, of course, thank you. And uh, to be here with Dakin on stage and to be somehow proximate with Noguchi is such an honor and a privilege. So um, this slideshow is intended to, and actually I should say, Dakin, sometimes when I look at you, I kind of see Noguchi. Uh, because <laughs> he just channels Noguchi so well. Um, I, of course, I never had the privilege to meet Noguchi, but um, this slideshow is in a way, um, you know, our work uh, meeting Noguchi's work. And so there's a dialogue here going on. Um, I'm sure it's clear uh, whose work is whose, uh, but we wanted to, um, in a sense, to, to, to kind of support the, the talk here with these kind of this conversation going on in imagery. Um, the studio is very small. Um, it's myself uh, leading design. Um, Malika Leeper, my partner here, who's uh, <laughs> my director of cultural affairs um, and, and all around life support system. Uh, and then we have a studio artisan, um, uh, Sanjit Kim, and we have uh, an industrial design assistant, uh, Vara Yang, uh, working from Rotterdam. So we're a really small team, um, and we're growing, so we're, we're looking to hire. We'll talk about that after the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so these slides will loop in the background while we talk, and um, thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, yes, I am so grateful also to Susan uh, Swig, who uh, stays very in, in close contact with us in architecture and design at SFMOMA, and asked what I would be working on next, and I do have this upcoming exhibition called Conversation Pieces on Contemporary Furniture. and. Um, where I'm starting with the exhibition is um, thinking about pieces that are uh, variations on, on conversations. And it might be a conversation that a, a designer kind of imagines um, with a historical figure, or maybe you know, someone they never met, but there feels like there's a resonance with their practice. It might be a conversation amongst peers, a kind of group, a movement, um, really pinging off each other all the time. Um, it could be a conversation with a very uh, strong cultural issue uh, environmental issue, um, social issues, and um, or it could also, uh, I'm also finding um, specific conversations um, with, uh, sorry, one more, last one, oh, right, to provoke a conversation with a public, like how, do, how can I use this chair to get the audience to start talking about, like what, what's going on here, what, what's happening here, and in thinking about um, going between past and present, I have really enjoyed and valued the conversations that I'm having with contemporary designers around this exhibition that's really helping me think, think through it, think about contemporary design differently. And Stephen is one of the designers of the eight that I'm, I'm working with. And um, that exhibition is gonna open in the fall too and will feature the Kita. And what has been very interesting is asking who, what designers do you look to for influence? Who, who ha, is the designer that still resonates with you from, from the past? And it really is, Noguchi comes up over and over and over again. Um, but before we get into reasons of why Noguchi, I, I wanted to hear a little bit um, from each of you, maybe taken first, on what it is like to, okay, you, you are kind of the keeper of the history of Noguchi, but you also uh, curate exhibitions with contemporary designers. Um, do you look for exhibitions that you feel are kind of in the same vein of Noguchi or similar to Noguchi, or are you really looking for differences to be able to talk about, um, I don't know, differences among uh, those designers? Would it have been something Noguchi would have wanted, too? Um, how do you curate, uh, I guess, with contemporary design at, at It's at It's really museum? incredibly idiosyncratic. Um, it's not systematic at all. Um, I try to uh, work with people who, who self-select into Noguchi's solar system, 
Um, we, we don't do circle of, we don't do obviously influenced by, we're not trying to counter program Noguchi either. Um, we're sort of constantly trying to unpeel the onion. You know, Noguchi is complicated. Um, his intent is complicated. He's really a conceptual artist in the practice of a modernist. Um, you know, but he, he's a postmodern in every possible way. Um, but it's, that's often obscured by the level of finish, the kind of finish, the formal qualities of the work, um, in, uh, the, across the whole spectrum of the things that he did. Um, that's also very important, is that we try to program the museum across the full range of his own pra interlocking practices. You know, we really think of him not as, as cross-disciplinary so much as transdisciplinary, because he's kind of floating above the top and picking and choosing where he you know, is inspired. Um, but it is amazing how many people, you know, I don't, I don't go out soliciting things at all uh, because it's so much by gut. Um, and there are a lot of people too that I trust. We, we, I answer every email that comes to the museum with any kind of proposal or submission or inquiry or anything because you just never know where inspiration is gonna come from. And, um, and so we've had entire exhibitions that have just walked through the door as an email to info at noguchi.org, you know, which is great. Um, because it's, uh, we're interested in people who think that Noguchi has something mm -hmm. to say for them or is resonant for them in some way. The current show with Objects of Common Interest, um, they both went to Columbia to architecture school and started coming to the museum in 2007. And uh, it's just in their creative DNA. You know, they started looking at Noguchi when they were 20 and have been looking at Noguchi ever since, and not in any obvious kind of way, um, but they started sending just totally ludicrous proposals um, to us about five years ago of things that they wanted to do to the museum. And, um, you know, I started off my relationship with them thinking they were crazy um, and thinking, oh, we'll never do that. And, uh, but they, you know, they lodged in my brain and uh, one thing leads to another. And um, we were preparing for a different world when we planned that show. You know, I really thought that it would be, I said, sort of an existential exhale. Um, at the end of, uh, you know, we were looking at all getting vaccinated, everything's gonna be fine. And, and it didn't work out that way, but um, you know, it's, it is not a show that in any obvious way belongs at the museum, but it makes the museum better and more interesting for a moment. Um, and I mean, think that's incredibly important that these are, they're all transient, these interactions. Um, but, but we're just trying to put Noguchi through a prism and split the beam so that it's easier to understand its component parts. And that, by the way, that doesn't work for a lot of artists and designers because uh, the first thing I tell them is this show is about Noguchi. It is not about you. And if that's okay, great. And if it's not okay, that's okay too. But uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to make a show that's about the, in the total work of art that's here. Now that you've been there almost 10 years, it, it, um, and you were mentioning people who were you know, working so closely with Noguchi have now passed on, and it's, the, the history is getting a little further away. Are you shifting you know, from when you started uh, and, and really kind of trying to stay in the same vein and, and maybe trying to, now are you feeling a little looser or more comfortable being more expansive or do you find yourself kind of returning to that mission statement or I, I don't know, the, the core um, impetus of the museum? You know, he was amazingly forward looking. So the, the, the sort of museum's charter, which is really his last will and testament is incredibly simple. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are no limitations in it whatsoever. He trusted his board, which was mostly made up, the Osama Noguchi Foundation board at the time was made up of his friends and associates. Uh, they were people that he worked with and knew and trusted. Um, and I think the board continues to be, it is, it's not sort of a typical museum board. Um, and we, we are in the enviable, but also very strange position of being sort of equally protectors and promoters. Um, and we, we, that's a fine line sometimes, um, for sure, that, that we try to walk. But, um, you know, I, th I think, honestly, the people that he worked with 
are, were, are the most expansively minded. And you know, I went to them all the time because as we, we continue to make things and we continue to try to sort of push Noguchi into the future, um, but we try to do it following paths that have been established, um, uh, always expanding the envelope a little bit, but doing it within a structure. Um, and, and we did just this summer lose Masatoshi Izumi, who was the stone worker in Japan that Noguchi worked with for three decades, um, who died in July. And two years back, Shoji Sadao. Um, and if, and if you're interested in either of these people, you should look on our website. Uh, we created kind of memorial essays about them. Shoji Sadao was the right-hand man of Buckminster Fuller and Asami Noguchi. So two of the most creative and crazy people of the 20th century. And Shoji is the person who made everything that they did that was large scale and public work. So Shoji designed all of the domes and Shoji is the one who designed all of Noguchi's public spaces when it came to actually getting them on blueprints. Um, you know, totally remarkable person um, who died at 92 a couple of, of years ago. But he's the one that I would go to to ask about all of these things. And his response was always push forward, push ahead, um, you know, and just trying to find the language and get comfortable in the language. Stephen, while I, I feel like in your work, and maybe it's, maybe it's evolving, but it, my, my first impression is uh, maybe not so much um, always thinking about the past and the present, but um, that there was, I would say, kind of a, a fissure that happened in design where craft went one way, uh, what was called industrial design went another way. And it feels like part of your effort and work is why did that happen and can it not come back together? And I, I really enjoy how you explore so many different um, artisanal practices as well as manufacturing practices. Like you, you seem just insatiable of wanting to learn um, uh, how, how things are made and, and wanted to hear a little bit about how you also like kind of approach something. Are you looking for craft that maybe is in the same vein of how um, something is uh, produced industrial, like a kind of a, a common aesthetic, or are you looking for tension um, where it, it, there's an excitement of like, what's happening? How did these two come together? Uh, there's just so much I want to say right now. Yes, good. <laughs> I don't know where Please. to start. <laughs> but after hearing Dakin talk about Noguchi in that way, I realized that my connection to Noguchi is through his complexity. I think that we have uh, so little space in contemporary culture for artists that aren't easily explainable. And, and maybe it's something about the legibility of, of craft that, that attracts me. Um, you know, I've always thought that everyone's capable of design. Um, and in working with uh, various artisans around the world, um, in over 10 countries on four continents, you know, what continues to come up is that hands have power. Um, hands have political power, hands have communal power, um, hands have the ability to do things that machines can't. And they are, literally are, kind of translators of ideas, right? From the eye to the mind uh, to the hand. And, and so, you know, I guess when I started, um, it's, it's also connected to Noguchi in a way. Um, when I started, I was looking for my own voice in design. Um, I was looking for a reason for me to exist in design and having so many ideas and wanting to participate and finding that that participation um, uh, maybe wasn't necessarily about me and, and my identity, but, but was more about just you know, wanting to make things and, and being curious and sort of following my, my dream of design. Um, but then, you know, the world kind of quickly uh, reminds you that you are a certain person. And like Noguchi, I had to leave America to understand myself as an American in a larger global context, right? So to be cosmopolitan is to be in the world and, and to understand how, you know, you relate to the world. And so my work is very much about um, 
looking at design as a more inclusive project. Uh, so how do we allow the other 90% or, or what we consider to be the majority world to participate in design with a capital D, um, which we came to realize is a Western project, right? Um, cultures all over the world have been making things for centuries without it being considered design, quote unquote. And so it's that type of work that's interesting to me. I mean, I've just been trying to kind of build bridges from uh, the artisans that I've worked with and, and learned from and, and studied with and, you know, collaborated with over the years um, to uh, the companies that I've worked with, right? So something between, I think my practice is about, and I think the future of design is about, something between um, this kind of European model that we've defined in the 20th century and, you know, the rest of how other people make things around the world. And how that sets up, I think, a very interesting project for the 21st century. I'm so happy to hear you say out loud sort of you, where you're seeing the connections with Noguchi. And I, 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 I heard that over and over again, speaking to the other designers uh, for conversation pieces too. There, there was this interest in, I don't want to be just an artist or a designer. Why can't I be both? Uh, Non-categorization, um, bicultural, and um, I, I do design because I want people to touch sculpture. Um, there. It's confusing, though. Yeah. I mean, I got to be honest. Like, if you have studied industrial design, and and I think our our way of studying and our way of approaching design forces you into you know, individual tracks. Um, if I look at the mid-century and how design diverged in Europe versus the way that it was kind of accepted here in America, mm. in Europe they were developing tools for living, whereas here in America we were developing more tools for work. And so the designer, the industrial designer, became a kind of corporate tool in this country. Um, but we may want to do other things. We may actually want to see it differently. And, and so... You know, if I take the Studio Museum exhibition as an example, when that show came up, I mean, the Studio Museum had never shown design before. And uh, I think they were interested in the way that I was looking at communities mm -hmm. as a source, uh, not only of inspiration, but of production. Thinking about this concept of the hand factory. Um, how can uh, this collective of, of hands actually you know, produce and, and then create kind of economic transformation through design. Um, but I'm showing at the Studio Museum, and so that the, in one way, they didn't want, we weren't looking at products, we were looking at concepts, and those concepts were somewhere between art and design. And, and that's a very confusing place to be in America, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it, it's the labels and categories that are the problem. Mm. You know, the Noguchi despised what I call the Bacchanization of creativity, which is what Stephen just explained. Um, and there are reasons for it, but they're not good reasons at the end of the day. And the, the reality is I think the reason why Noguchi is, is, seems like more and more of an avatar all the time is that he didn't accept those and he just pushed through. And it was to his detriment all the time. Um, I mean, one of the stories I tell is the first sort of first conversation I ever had with Arnie Glimpshire, who at Pace Gallery, who made the Noguchi Museum possible, um, and it was by stereotyping Noguchi in a way and his practice and what he was about, and it was very effective. Um, but uh, Arnie himself says, "I spent my entire career with Noguchi, trying to protect Noguchi the sculptor from Noguchi the designer." And that was necessary in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And, but I think we can all agree it's one of the few great things that is happening is that those barriers are breaking down. And creative people are getting the freedom, demanding the freedom, really, to practice the way they want to practice. And more and more, the art world accepts that. The design world accepts that. Everybody accepts that an artist's practice is what they say it is. And then it may cross over a lot of these borders and boundaries. Um, it was very hard in Noguchi's day to do that. Um, but I think there are a lot of artists and designers and just creative people in general who are grateful to him for having done it 
He's not the only one by any stretch of the imagination who did that, but he is one of the pioneers who sort of showed that it was possible and that you could have the career that you wanted to have by sticking to your guns and doing the things that you wanted to do. And it's, it's such a powerful singular vision that is inspiring because it's expressed over so many different forms of, of media, right? And materials. So, I mean, for me, seeing the Akari lights and, and thinking, them, thinking of them as light sculptures was a kind of breakthrough. Wow, so a lamp can be a sculpture. I'd never thought of that before. Or, or seeing Noguchi's uh, coffee table and thinking, oh, so a sculpture can be <laughs> a coffee table. And they're, 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 you know, we don't have to have those kind of strict categories, that there, there can be other ways of approaching design. Or, or even the terrible sort of canonical, typical canonical way of explaining things. The Herman Miller coffee table is the progenitor of Noguchi's interlocking sculpture, mm -hmm. which is his you know, canonical museum sculpture. Museums want those pieces if they're going to have a Noguchi. But they all go back to the coffee table, not the other way around. It wasn't like, you know, sing, great single one-off sculpture begot coffee table. Um, it's the opposite. And that's almost always true for Noguchi because genius in one field is just common sense imported from another. And Noguchi was extremely good at taking industrial design and importing it into a so-called fine art practice. I think we're experiencing that even at SFMOMA, where it began as one collection and then became sort of five different collections based on discipline, and now coming back together of doing joint exhibitions, joint collections. And I'm going to look to Douglas Durkin here. Is this the only design and art fair where they're actually all together? Um, usually design is like the, the small tent down the road, right? And here it is all together. Vision. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to circle back to traveling. Uh, you know, that is something I think that is really important to you in your practice. It feels like it was something that was very important to Noguchi, but also in a um, not always in a pleasurable way. I mean, you mentioned y you kind of felt like you needed to get away from the U.S. Uh, and get perspective. And my sense of reading some of the biography, and I could be wrong here, uh, Deacon, is, is that there was also a feeling of escape and, and um, uh, from Noguchi as well. Like, t travel doesn't always mean something of looking forward to. Uh, it's a kind of self-discovery path. And I mean, maybe, maybe speaking a little bit about that, I have some questions about how, how, much, of, how much of the artisans you work with benefit from your own self-discovery. Like, how, what are those conversations that you, you have and how difficult or wonderful or complicated are they? Uh, I mean, I should say that, that the idea of getting away doesn't really work. You can't really get away. <laughs> I mean, if we think about all of the expats that have uh, traveled abroad to find creative freedom in the art world, in the design world, et cetera, I think what happens is uh, a kind of greater confrontation with the self, you know? So you, you never leave your history behind. You're only reminded of who you really are. And I think that, for me, that's been the beauty of, of travel uh, in my case, is that I came face to face with my identity. I had to go to work in Milan in order to do that. And then I had to go to work in South Africa and Senegal and Rwanda and Kenya and Peru and Mexico and India and Indonesia and the Philippines and <laughs> all over the world um, to be reminded of who I was, right? And so there's certain, when you talk about the conversation I'm having with the artisans there, there's certain expectations that they have, right? When they meet for the first time an African-American that they've, you know, they've never encountered before or a design industrial designer they've never encountered before. Um, and, and so in a lot of ways, it's that dialogue that makes the work so exciting, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm drawing from uh, a point of view that, that maybe I didn't enter into the conversation with, um, but I inherently have. And they're drawing from a point of view that, you know, is 
in, in many cases, ancient wisdom, you know, that's just passed on from generations. So I kind of, when I think about Noguchi and the way that he saw America as a nation of nationalities, um, and coming back to America now, um, because I had been living abroad and um, doing fellowships, et cetera, et cetera, and coming back to America now, um, I think clearly the strength of us in this country is our diversity and the ways that we have the potential to work together to make completely new experiences. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that, boy, I mean, there's so much there. It's beautiful. Um, you know, uh, Noguchi, it's so important to sort of place him historically because Noguchi was a huge believer in the American dream, which at, you know, changed radically over his lifetime. Um, but when he was thinking about it really actively uh, you know, around World War II and when he interned himself in an internment camp in, uh, with uh, those of Japanese heritage, you know, here we are in California where the vast majority of, of the internees came from, um, you know, he, he was finally confronted with his own identity, um, not something that he wanted to do necessarily, um, uh, because he sort of, he thought that he was a, sort of a universe of one. He just considered himself outside and above all of those issues and operated that way. Um, but to be confronted with this horrible fact, um, and he did confront it, um, but he really was a, you know, he, the progressive view at the time, the acceptable progressive view at the time, was a belief in the melting pot. And Noguchi believed in the melting pot. He believed in assimilation. He believed in the idea of us all coming together under a, the umbrella of a set of values. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, our, our, I'm, I'm old enough that I was raised with the melting pot, which, you know, became the salad or the stew or, you know, there, now there are a lot of different metaphors. Um, my kids are seven and 10, so I, I, you know, I hear a whole different, much more sophisticated version of this now, which is fantastic. Um, but I think that true, what the piece that you drew out of that wonderful essay, um, the idea of nation of all nationalities, which meant an enormous amount to him. Um, and that was why he traveled, you know, to a large extent as well, was looking for those. And we have to remember, it's back in the days when it was hard to travel. So he was a Life Magazine guy. I mean, people who were cu curious about the world, you, you found it through Life Magazine. And if you were very, very lucky, maybe you got to go to the, some of those places. Um, or maybe you just went and saw an exhibition by Bernard Ruofsky at MoMA in New York, you know, and, and learned about uh, architecture without architects, um, you know, which is a great subject that's really relevant to everything that we're talking about now. He was an Andre Malraux, Museum of Man kind of person. Um, he was a universalizer. He was traveling because he was looking for things that were common to people all over the world. And one of the things that he discovered, and this is something I think is such a great commonality with the way that you think, is craft is technology. And, and not only that, but cr crafts, the crafts that have been practiced, ceramics are what, 24,000 years old or something? That's the best technology, because it's survived that long. I mean, how many of the technologies, the sort of new technologies that are being developed right now are going to have a working life of 24,000 years? So Noguchi was really interested in finding those technologies. He called it the true development of old traditions. And I think that's something that you are also doing, you know, in a really profound way, is trying to take these things that have continuity. You know, Noguchi, I always think Noguchi was a whip stitcher. So he's always going and pulling into the past and pulling it forward into the future. Um, and he does that with technique and, and, but more perspective, you know, having a long view and, um, you know, nature and, t he also viewed nature and technology. Nature is the greatest technologist, obviously, um, but nature and technology are two sides of the same coin. And how do you, you know, the new nature idea was basically trying to, um, he really wanted to uh, not work after nature or model what he did after nature, but he really wanted to take her on and compete with nature, like head to head. That was the plan. Well, I, I noticed you named your uh, exhibition Shelter in Place, and travel is so important. The handmade, meeting with people, you know, talking with your hands, and um, the last two years have um, hindered that a little bit. 
I hear over and over again also that the last few years have, have been a good pause in a way of like thinking through what, where, where the priorities lie. And um, saying everything you said and all those great benefits, have there been benefits in the last two years or yeah. you just can't wait to put it all behind you? <laughs> Um, my son likes to talk about how I take risks by traveling, uh, given the pandemic and everything. But I think about Noguchi and this idea of universality and the way that um, he was such a big thinker. Uh, and I think that, that that's such an inspiration for me, especially in this day and age when we carry the world's information in our pockets. You know, we kind of take it for granted. The idea of going back and pulling from history and bringing it forward I mean, we're doing this on a regular basis every few seconds, right? And so um, with Shelter in Place, you know, in a lot of ways, the past few years has taught us to work in a completely new way. Um, I am lucky enough to have an assistant on the other side of the world. Uh, and so during the pandemic, we've been communicating back and forth just through you know, very simple means uh, through WhatsApp, you know, little sketches on my phone and, and all these things. And, and the idea that, you know, you don't necessarily need to travel um, in order to do the work, that sometimes you have to be in place to do the work. Uh, so, so that for us was, uh, I mean, it was great because we were spending so much time together that we kind of, and I think like most of us, all of a sudden you're working from home, your kids are going to school at home, uh, <laughs> you're with the same group of people all the time, you know, and you're at home all the time, and maybe we hadn't been at home much during that time. And so um, we had to kind of re reinvent the way we were living. And, and many of the ideas in the, in the speculative project of the show come out of that reinvention. So just things like thinking about our television in a completely new way or thinking about our devices, you know, like our phones in a new way. Um, how do we support them, uh, for example? Or how do you have a private phone call with everybody in the same room, for example? Um, are there products that don't exist already that we could develop that could support that? So this is really what the, what the show's about. Nobody should have to share an office with their spouse. <laughs> it's just wrong. I'm married to an attorney, so it's, it has particular poignance for me. Well, it sounds like Stephen might have something designed. Yeah, he's working that. on a solution. It's good. <laughs> we live and work together. And there's, you know, this is the classic designer's dream, right? Everyone thinks Charles and Ray Eames, but... You know, I would love to have been in the room when they were actually arguing all the time. Um, there's a lot of sparks that come up for sure, uh, and it's it's a lot of fun at the same time. So, yeah. So maybe there's time for a couple of questions before. If there are any questions from the crowd, um, I think Laura has a microphone and can. Where's Rob? <laughs> I just saw it. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Um, so thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I have a com uh, question specifically for Stephen. I think I'm, I and I'm sure some other people in the room are probably architects. Uh, and I'm just curious how. Uh, when you knew that you wanted to go into industrial design, because I saw on one of the slides you went to Columbia for your master's in architecture, is that correct? So I'm just curious when you made the transition and what that was like for you. Uh, yeah, you the question's for you yeah, yeah, yeah. as I'll just, uh, I'll your just background that. in architecture. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny because I grew up in Chicago and if you grew up in <laughs> Chicago, you're, you're, it's all right there, yeah. you know, modernism is, you're surrounded basically. So when I was in high school, I was already writing about Mies van der Rohe and Frank Lloyd Wright and these guys. And, and I kind of discovered design through my study of the Bauhaus. And so I didn't know about design when I applied to IIT, my undergrad, in a professional degree program in architecture. And then I found out, oh, the Institute of Design is in the basement of Crown Hall, um, which I... 
only applied to IIT because Crown Hall was there. So <laughs> it kind of, it's always been both for me in a sense. Um, although I wanted to be a sculptor first, um, I found my way to design through architecture. And then I went back to school for architecture thinking that design was too small a field. So <laughs> then when I finished architecture, I realized that design was all I could do because I didn't have the patience to um, submit myself to an architecture firm for years before building anything. So I don't know, you know, it's, it's, um, I think everybody's path is different and, and often you just kind of have to follow your passion, you know, maybe it's doing both or doing all three. Noguchi's was almost in reverse, right? Starting in sculpture and then partnering maybe with Soji Sadao or landing in architecture and landscape architecture. Yeah, and he spent a lot of time uh, collaborating with architects. Obviously, some of his most important partners, um, you know, uh, five years on a playground pro project for New York City with Louis Kahn that never came to be, but then built many wonderful things with G G Gordon Bunshaft of SOM. Um, so, yeah, but he, he, I would say, you know, don't tell anybody that, or don't listen to anybody who tells you that you have to transition you know, or that like these are totally different countries or, you know, different planets almost, because um, they don't have to be, um, you know, there's, there are ways to keep it all connected. Um, and the best work, I think the most interesting work is the work that doesn't submit itself to the pigeonholing. And they can exist on the same plane, you know, there doesn't have to be this hierarchy of design, architecture, design, art, whatever. That was impromptu, not that anyone's higher than the other. <laughs> you know, they can all exist at the same time. Any last questions? Okay, Susan. <laughs> um, I guess my question for probably both, or all three of you even, is where do you see the necessity, the necessity for formal or academic education in the fine art, industrial design, that whole field versus just pursuing something because you feel so connected to it and like have such big dreams around it. Where are those kind of differentiated or are they not for you? I mean, I have to quote Noguchi, it's not either or, it's all, you know? I don't think one replaces the other. And I'm a big believer in education. I think everyone in this country should go to college. Um, if not, get their masters um, and, and keep studying, you know, continually studying. Um, studying and practicing go hand in hand, you know. When you, when you get a new project, of course, you have to study to understand what you're doing in a sense, right? And, and I also feel connected to Noguchi's work because of history. I mean, obviously, it's a shame, but a lot of uh, schools today don't teach design history, or a lot of students today don't study architecture history. And, and I could not imagine being a contemporary practitioner and not understanding history. We can't know where we're going if we don't know where we've been. But also keep questioning history. I would throw in there, too. Don't, <laughs> don't just accept it. Keep, keep, be, keep a critical lens. <laughs> Yeah, it works every which way. I mean, that's the thing. There shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a prerequisite. Actually, the very last thing that Noguchi told that class of students at the Art Institute when he was here in 1970 was, get out of school, <laughs> um, which they took personally <laughs> at the Art Institute. Uh, but no, I think, it, 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 I think what Steven said is right. It's all, all of the above. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it, different things work for different people. Noguchi was a college dropout. Uh, you know, he was there in med school and left early. His mom pushed him to go to art school, and he did that. And one thing led to another. He never went back to school, but he was a person who never stopped learning. So learning is essential, for sure. How you do it, though, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Susan, do you want to close it out? <laughs> Well, I, I, mine's not really a question. Mine's um, a comment, first of all, about how inspirational this talk is and how grateful I am that you guys are here. And um, just listening to you, um, first of all, I think 
Noguchi for president. <laughs> um, but besides that, this sort of talk about the interconnectedness of life and of um, these different modalities um, is such a metaphor of how um, when I see good things in life happening, that is what it is. And, you know, it comes through design, it comes through nature, and it's uh, giving us these lessons that uh, both of you have uh, elevated today. And so um, I'm, I'm just really grateful. So thank you. And thanks, Jennifer, too. Beautiful thank sense, you. Susan. Yeah. And thank you for this fair, which is, <laughs> is about openness and pluralism and that, that inspiration doesn't have to come categorized and labeled and put in its boxes. Uh, it is inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>